get ready to welcome our next set of speakers and we have another very exciting session of the day which is on the topic of office real estate at a cusp managing tenant expectations so let me introduce our panel members uh, the session is moderated by Mr. Ramesh Nair, CEO India and Managing Director Market Development Asia Colliers. With a diverse experience of over 23 years, Ramesh Nair's career has been focused on driving transformational change and delivering real estate solutions to domestic and multinational owners, investors and occupiers across India and South Asia. At Colliers, Ramesh is overseeing the overall direction, strategy and growth of the India's business. He also drives business development and key relationship management across APEC. So this was our moderator of the session. Let me now introduce our speakers in the alphabetical order. Let me welcome Mr. Amit Ramani, founder and CEO of Office Space Solutions. Amit Ramani started Office with the vision of revolutionizing the office space delivery ecosystem in India through technology. He has over 18 years of experience in areas of master planning, strategic planning, design management, workplace and business process improvement, six six uh, based strategies and facility planning. His strong background has allowed him to provide innovative and complex project services for multinational corporations. He is also an active member of RICS and NASCOM. Our next eminent panel member, I introduce Ms. Anita Nordis. Lead facilities and admin at Walt Disney Company with 20 plus years experience in the corporate real estate and facility management industry. Her prior work experience was with Hipro Spectrum Mine, Thomson Reuters, JLL and Entity. She has extensive market knowledge in real estate transactions, project planning, facilities management, and EHS. She has led teams capable of adapting to growing business needs of organization, change management, and provide strategic approach to business for real estate and FM. Our next a very eminent panel member is Mr. Pradeep Lala, Managing Director and CEO, Embassy Services Private Limited. Pradeep Lala joined Embassy Services in 20, 2013, and in a short span of time, he has taken Embassy Services to become one of the largest business units within the Embassy Group. Pradeep drives the firm's international footprint through new offices and global client relationships, and he has over three decades of experience and has held various leadership roles. Our next panel member, let me introduce Mr. Rajendra Kalka, President Malls, the Phoenix Mills Limited. Mr. Rajendra Kalka manages three Phoenix Market City assets at Mumbai, Pune, and Bengaluru with a collective retail consumption in excess of rupees 45. 1,000 crores per annum. He has been leading with demonstrable business leadership and encompassing marker, martech, events and promotions, leasing, legal, fit outs, design and architecture, VM, operations, facility management, accounts, among many other responsibilities. Let me introduce our final panel member, Mr. Vinod Rohira, CEO, Mindspace Business Park Suite. A veteran in the uh, real estate industry, Vinod Rahira has been instrumental in leading the development of premium commercial real estate for the company across India. Under his ages, the company has pioneered the concepts of a landmark business trips, districts and established brand Mindspace, the self-contained world-class business districts, districts across India. He has also been instrumental in shaping prominent shopping destinations and Uber luxury residential for the group. So this is our eminent panel. And now I request our moderator to please take over the proceedings. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Atnam, for that uh, lovely introduction. And uh, thanks for uh, organizing uh, this uh, panel. Uh, Reality Plus uh, always uh, manages to get uh, very, very good uh, speakers. So good afternoon, uh, friends. Uh, great to have your uh, attention and thanks for uh, attending this uh, panel discussion. My name is uh, Ramesh Nair and uh, I work with Colliers Asia. I'd like to thank uh, Sapna and Reality Plus for uh, organizing uh, this very relevant panel with uh, some of uh, our uh, industry's most experienced uh, thought leaders. Uh, I welcome you to this uh, unique uh, interactive panel discussion. The title of uh, the panel is uh, Office Real Estate uh, at a Cusp, Managing Tenant uh, Expectations. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to be uh, and privilege to be moderating uh, this uh, session. And uh, thank you for uh, welcoming uh, all our uh, industry stalwart uh, panelists. Subject is uh, very, uh, very timely. 
uh, we hope to uh, get uh, get uh, uh, opinions from uh, our uh, thought leaders uh, on this panel on how uh, tenants uh, uh, expectations are changing and how as stakeholders of the industry we can manage those uh, expectations uh, now uh, let me uh, come uh, to the panel I'll, I'll start the first uh, first question uh, with you uh, uh, anita this uh, so much of uh, talk around uh, sustainability health uh, safety more than uh, more than ever before and uh, that seems to be a big big priority uh, for uh, organizations so what are those uh, few things which have kind of changed for uh, organizations for reentry uh, i was uh, moderating a panel yesterday and i realized that uh, even today most multinationals uh, reentry is less than 5 some indian companies have touched uh, 15% but uh, almost all multinationals have less than 5% of uh, uh, reentry in some industries it's a little uh, more so what is change for reentry and uh, what are your top 3 priorities uh, for uh, employees as they are uh, as they make their uh, reentry uh, back to their uh, offices thanks ramesh for this question good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you uh, sapna and reality plus to have me in this panel uh, so as you rightly said uh, ramesh one of the key challenge which most of the organization is facing is you know to see how the reentry uh, is a success uh, to start with i would say that uh, the leadership is taking a conscious decision on how they could set example and that's where the 5% uh, occupancy has started and and then we are working together collaboratively uh, with all the uh, cross functional partners which is one of the key priorities uh, you name it your hr functions your legal functions it key business stakeholders to understand what are the needs and what are the objective which we could look into to ensure you know uh, we we look at uh, re entry a uh, success in phase man manner so this is the approach which we are following and uh, as everyone is aware uh, uh, the key concern in today's corporate uh, world is uh, recruitment you know holding the talent pool uh, uh, with with work from home uh, majority of the employees have gone back to uh, to their hometown and you know they they've gone into a kind of comfort zone to uh, work from anywhere or work from home and you know the challenge which the organization is facing is how to get them back to the office while uh, we work uh, in a safe and secure and sustainable workspace uh, one of the top priorities which i would like to talk about is uh, there are a lot of surveys which is going on which hr is uh, taking to understand what how uh, we could look at a success reentry uh, from employees point of view so there are flexible where you know employees are saying that they are flexible they would want to come to office but they would like a flexibility like two days work from home and uh, three days work from office so we are revolving on all, around those thoughts on how we could look at those talent pool to ensure that they enter into a safe and secure building and an office premise iot is playing one of the key role uh, where we introducing and investing in a lot of technology Uh, minimizing the touch points and uh, uh, introducing table communication, communicating to all the employees, you know how safe and secure their workspaces. There are organizations who are also looking at redesigning their workspace, you know, uh, uh, where they are looking at uh, in getting in more greens in their workspace, getting in uh, more um, uh, collaborative approach, abiding to the the norms of. uh maintaining the social distancing uh and ensuring you know most of the touch points are uh, looked into and uh, the visitors management you know how are we going to look at introducing calling visitors and clients for meetings so all these are being worked into and you know that's been compiled in a form of playbook uh, uh last last week i was uh, with a ceo of a large it company and uh, he was being very frank and he said uh, he is actually worried if you push employees to come back uh whether they will quit the company yes so uh, that uh, i was quite shocked to hear that and he's saying we are going very slow because we don't want to lose employees attrition levels have picked up because all these startups and unicorns are coming in 
paying very high uh, salaries. Is that a valid uh, uh, worry? Yes, that is absolutely a valid worry. All sectors, you know, whether it's an IT firm, entertainment firm, uh, and, and majority of the talent pool uh, are the millennials. And, um, and keeping them in mind, you know, they are uh, very cognizant about, and they are, they are going slow, you know. Most of the organization are going slow, and that's where the leadership is taking a, a, a key role on, you know, setting examples that, you know, they have started coming to office and, and phase-wise, they will evaluate the risk assessment and then look at uh, the L2 level and their team to come to office. So it doesn't look like by this year end, you know, there would be uh, a re-entry re for level three and plus, but we are looking towards and communication, as I said, plays a very, very key, key role. You know, we are looking at ensuring that a right set of communication is passed on to the right talent pool because they know that the office is safe, secure. It's not only the office, it's also the building services is, is quite safe, secure for them to uh, uh, return back to work. And I, I think this is going to change uh, uh, in phase manner and be looking at more talent pool coming in. Um, that's, that's the expectation and that's what we are working towards is uh, by... Q1 of next year is what we we are looking at, you know, a 30, 25 to 30% talent pool uh, coming back to work. So again, uh, uh, Anita, we, like, uh, this is like the residential market. Uh, when I started uh, moderating residential panels in 2013, uh, every quarter I used to, uh, we used to say that the market is going to improve uh, six months later. And uh, our re-entry uh, ever since second quarter of last year, we've been saying it's going to improve, it's going to improve, it's going to improve. Uh, earlier this week, I was talking to Infosys and uh, he was saying it's uh, like 3-4% again. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's worrying. And uh, it just keeps, now we are seeing Jan, uh, but Jan is only two months away. And I, I, I'm worried in Jan if you'll say April again, and April we'll say July again. And it's just going on and on and on. So where do you see some amount of, I know we were hoping uh, once uh, double vaccinated. Today, you know, most corporate going adults uh, are double vaccinated. I was just checking our company's uh, numbers. We have like 3,000 employees and a lot of people are double vaccinated. Uh, still, why, are we, why is there so much of uh, problems? Companies are scared. I haven't seen any company use the word compulsorily come back to work. Uh, every senior manager I meet says he wants employees to come back. Every senior manager. And I'm not saying CEOs, I'm talking anybody from a vice president, director. They all want employees to come back, collaborate, work, be more productive. Uh, how do we sort this out, Anita? I'm, I'm like confused and, we've been, and I look stupid because uh, every panel uh, over the last uh, 18 months have been saying next quarter is going to be uh, much more. Uh, in terms of uh, re-entry? Uh, I think it remains a challenge, you know, because uh, mm. employees' mi mindset, you know, and as, as I told you, the talent pool, the age matters a lot, you know. Uh, millennials, if you see their mindset, you know, which is one of the majority uh, talent in most of the organization, IT or entertainment, um, they are not a kind of people who would love to be at home and and th there will be a point where they will break out. And, and with the surveys which is going on, employees are looking forward to come to office, but they are uh, either, uh, uh, you know, put a setback by their family members that is it safe to go back to the hometown or, I mean, you know, go back to their workspace. Uh, so that's where organization is playing a key role. And one of the strategy which we work uh, uh, and we are providing to the leadership team is, you know, evaluate the opportunities like you you talk about flexi seats you talk about hub and spoke model you know uh, there are a lot of players which has been uh, in india uh, which provides this uh, flexibility of uh, work from their uh, their office space you know flex seating is one of the key yeah, uh, trends have which one is of the, we have the one of the best yeah, amid, uh, on would, this panel so. <laughs> No, and I would definitely, and, and that's what I'm urging the leadership team as well to look differently, you know, not to ensure the uh, the talent pool comes to their office, but, you know, create a uh, an environment where you give flexibility to employees, you know, uh, not uh, uh, work from their home, uh, a combination of work from home, work from office or work from anywhere, you know, have uh, a hub and spoke model, which is, which is kind of a 
trend and it was a success in in my previous organization where organization was closing down you know with the first and second wave closing down offices and you know reducing the footprint of their office space uh, we had evaluated out of the box uh, uh, approach uh, framework uh, on uh, uh, a global player uh, where we worked on a fantastic model which was quite attractive and believe me you ramesh you know later on uh, there were demand which was increasing uh, in in uh, the model so i think one of the approach which can and should be evaluated in, uh, for uh, most of the organization they name it as flex space or swing space or hub and spoke so that is one of the key point which will attract employees to start getting out of their shell you know getting out of their residence and and look at either work to closer to their home any any of the co-working partner closer to their home with hub and spoke or having the team needs so that is one of the opportunities which can be leveraged second is you know support from the developers you know how uh, they enhance the lung space is what they call uh, now when we go for site inspection so you know the demand uh, where i've seen in first and second way uh, a phase of uh, covid where we were looking at shutting down offices post second wave there are demand especially in india where you know there are uh, spaces uh, going on you i mean colleagues have done success transactions uh, in in uh, pune and uh, other cities so you know hyderabad hyderabad is one of the state which we speak about it's it's growing immensely jp morgan has uh, inaugurated a youth space for uh, uh, for their employees so you know um, i feel this is a phase which will go but keeping the worry in mind which the leadership has the organization has um hr has also started uh, developing some training training uh, activities and you know having uh, some uh, some uh, uh, collective uh, collaborative sessions with their employees to understand the pulse of the employees and evaluate and see how they could support uh, the employees and you know which will help them to at least retain the uh, employee retention which is one of the key uh, concern which is raising thanks uh, thanks anita for that very uh, detailed uh, well well said uh, on all the points amit let me come to you uh, amit uh, earlier this week uh, i was with a client uh, who has a significant uh, presence uh, in cities like kochi and uh, he was telling me about this uh, data point he was saying nearly 3 million uh, kerlites have come back to kerala in this uh, pandemic i was shocked to hear that because 3 million keralites is uh, like uh, 10% of the population and uh, he also said a lot of people from other states who are in cochin and trivandrum have kind of gone back so this trend of reverse migration is something for real is uh, what he was saying and uh, are you seeing that uh, i know you are a very big uh, player in uh, tier 1 uh, uh, cities currently are you seeing that uh, moving towards uh, tier 2 cities these flexi spaces what are the trends you're seeing amit so uh, thank you ramesh uh, for the opportunity and thanks to alt plus for inviting me on this panel um you know so ramesh uh, for the last 12 months right um i have been the strongest proponent of tier 2 cities right i think i was the only one screaming on the top of my voice it's going to happen and now i didn't happening, i didn't believe right? you at that time yeah, but right, now right. clients and, are saying yeah and and now i think you are getting converted a bit right so i, am I think uh, uh, clearly ramesh i think what is what what we are seeing is that the reverse migration is real right um out of the uh, the the metro cities 60% of the people went to uh seven or eight uh, of these cities of which kochi is one right so clearly uh, that reverse migration people have gone back to these cities and the last two years these cities have grown in both in terms of opportunity as well as in terms of lifestyle right two reasons why people came to tier one cities uh, and now uh, to anita's earlier point clearly you know companies are looking to retain their talent at any cost right if that means that they have to provide a uh, work near home options in their tier 2 cities they are looking to do that right so uh, from that standpoint we are seeing a lot of traction um, we uh, strongly believed in it and we have opened an amdavad indore uh, yeah. and here we will go into jaipur lucknow kochi to nagpur this year uh, so we have strongly believed in it and we are seeing some traction 
A couple of other data points. I think the second piece is the war for talent, right? If you want to go and hire, even with the top-notch salary in oh. cities like Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai, you can't find talent, right? And clearly, if you look at these tier two towns like uh, Indore or Jaipur, the talent is available, right? And uh, clearly, the story which in the first phase of our journey of success of commercial real estate was on the back of IT ITS companies doing outsourcing for BPOs and KPOs. Today, if you see the India stack, right? The unicorns and the startups of India are not looking to service outside India. They're looking to service India. And if you're looking to service India, you need to find talent that can speak in local language, regional language. And that doesn't happen in tier one cities, happens in tier two cities. So clearly the war for talent has gone from just the tier one cities now transferring to uh, tier two cities. And many cities are seeing the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, opportunities there. And there's a lot of uh, non-branded players. I think we are one of the top players in the branded space to be going into uh, tier two, but there are a lot of non-branded players which are already there as far as co-working goes. The third data point I think Ramesh is very interesting is that out of, um, you know, if you were to look at cities like uh, Jaipur, Kochi, Chandigarh and so on, um, almost anywhere between 40 to 20 funded startups are in these cities, in these, uh, you know, tier two cities today. Out of the okay. 70 billion uh, that got invested in India over the last 18, 24 months, about a billion got invested in tier two city startups, right? Um, so it's a start, but a billion, you know, if I was to look at where we were about six, seven years ago, that was the same numbers that we were getting in tier one cities. Um, so clearly, I think the, you know, as uh, Rakesh Junjunwala says, you know, uh, tier two city ka time aage hai. it's here now right i mean there's no question that and uh, the the final point is all all uh, top occupiers right of any merit are seriously evaluating a tier two strategy and some are further along they have gone into actually uh, taking up space but i think uh, in the next 22 and 23 clearly tier two cities will see a lot of action from the occupiers setting up spaces uh, working with flex operators to provide spaces, uh, as well as obviously, you know, look at servicing uh, Bharat and, and the India story uh, out of these cities. Amit, uh, which five cities would you pick out of tier two? So, Jaipur, Chandigarh, Ahmedabad, uh, Kochi, and uh, Lucknow would be my top five picks. Jaipur, Chandigarh, Ahmedabad, Lucknow, and uh... Kochi, are you finding enough uh, good quality real estate options in these uh, cities? So, so that's the other thing, right? So Ramesh, mm -hmm. if I was to go to a city like Jaipur, where I said, you know, there are 40 plus funded startups. Um, in fact, there is a couple of unicorns already out of Jaipur. There are probably five compliant buildings in all of Jaipur, right? So, so the opportunity is not just for the occupier, the opportunity is for the developer community as well, because, you know, if, if that is the level of, uh, stock available and you see a surgeons coming from occupiers, then if I was in the developer space, I'm not, I work with developers and partner with them, I would be making a beeline for the tier two cities. Pradeep, uh, you you work for uh, a subsidiary of one of India's largest uh, developers. I remember uh, making uh, some rounds with Jitu long back in Coimbatore. I think pre uh, Lehman uh, days, I remember RMZ venturing out into Mangalore, Cochin, all that. None of them took off uh, at that time. Uh, are you, uh, as uh, I, I'm talking about the uh, parent arm, are you, uh, is there a tier two strategy which you've discussed uh, recently given all these uh, things which are happening? So I think uh, we are still focusing on the tier one because from an opportunity perspective, it's huge. And uh, while uh, Bangalore is our hub and we have a huge land bank here and there's enough potential for us to grow here. And that's, that really being the largest uh, uh, consumer of real estate space, Bangalore, we are focusing here. And I'm sure you would be aware that with our merger of India Bulls happening, we'll definitely be in the West very soon. And being in the REIT, we also have a lot of uh, assets in the North. So I guess uh, we are still focusing more on the metros and the tier one cities. Amit, have you heard of any uh, of the top 10 big names uh, actively looking for land in tier two? I haven't. Have you? No, not, yet. not. not yet. You and But you're saying there's an opportunity. 
So, so Ramesh, my sense is that the tier one developers are probably not going to be the tier two developers, right? The tier two developers are either going to be homegrown or new age, um, okay. because I think it takes a, a while for a ship to move versus a boat moves very fast in you know stormy waters. So, got it. Pradeep, you you head one of the largest uh, facility management uh, organizations uh, in the country now. Uh, how are you partnering? with uh, with your uh, tenant base uh, to make sure uh, things are much more uh, smoother while coming back so i think uh, most important is coming back to work and trying to ensure that uh, we all fight the third wave and hopefully we no one wants it honestly but uh, a lot of learnings have gone into the first wave and the second wave where we understood things about uh, you know the protocols of sanitizing social distancing ppes all those things and at the same time in the second wave we also learned about uh, you know healthcare and more facilities towards uh, whether it was oxygen cylinders or healthcare and hospital beds at this point of time i think there's enough knowledge amongst us about what and how to take care of and most of us have understood that these are things we have to live with but uh, more importantly what's needed really is a lot of interaction with the occupiers on a regular basis a lot of transparency so what we are doing as embassy services you know we were very versatile and diverse portfolio in the sense we do office we do education residential co working co living manufacturing we do airports so what we've been doing in the last couple of months is gearing up and understanding what is the risk in each each vertical of the real estate for example uh, while we have to fight one common i would say the word enemy but the real thing is each each sector has a different element of risk so what we are trying to counter is make make a manual of the risks involved in every different vertical of the real estate industry and that's how we are going to plan and counter it of course having inventory levels and things like that is always a part of the game which we all understand today so there's nothing new about that so the risk is what we are trying to capture and go into that and most importantly we are trying to build that element of transparency because when the employees come back and if they are not transparent about the health conditions or the risk they've gone through of interacting with people then that increases the risk further so that's like a voluntary uh, disclosure of everybody you know voluntarily contributing and saying look i am a risk uh, i am i am at a risk of uh, passing it on to someone because i have interacted with so many people and then they stay back home and that's the kind of hybrid work atmosphere that the occupiers help us to achieve and that's i think that's the most important thing we are doing today cross learning and more of knowledge transfer got it uh, pradeep uh, rajendra you uh, had uh, probably the, one of the best uh, retail mall developers uh, in uh, in the country you have done a lot of work with uh, uh, phoenix you have some fantastic uh, financial partners gic cppib uh, uh, the other day i was uh, talking to the blackstone folks who have around 18 malls and they were saying sales has finally crossed the 2019 uh, sorry the pre covid numbers and uh, i was that's in spite of uh, multiplexes uh, 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 being uh, a challenging uh, a place uh, like most uh, most of the cities multiplexes are still not showing uh, fnb is still uh, uh, challenging even today in spite of that if mall developers are starting to cross pre covid numbers uh, and in spite of only 70 80% of the malls being actually operational uh, what are some of those uh, things you are keeping in mind uh, while uh, people are coming back uh, rajiv uh, it has been a very so earlier first of all very good afternoon to all of you the viewers listeners and thanks a lot to reality plus for organizing this lovely small panel ramesh it has been a very very difficult two years for retail and retail real estate i don't think anybody has to say anything everything was closed as compared to a lot of other businesses i think this was one of the most hard hit business uh gaining the confidence of customers was perhaps the most difficult challenge that all the mall developers faced and uh, i think that is what people the mall developers have overcome if you walk into any of our malls today uh, you will really feel that you are entering a very safe place you know the kind of uh, uh, developments that we have done to ensure give customer a kind of safety feeling they are very very high 
each mall today i think is spending 30 40 lakhs per month to ensure to give this safety feature only so that operational cost has actually gone up but we are trying to do that that said i think the customers were also really really serious in coming to shop because they were tired of one and a half year of sitting in closed spaces you know when anita said that it is very difficult for the millennials to come to offices because they are afraid it's reverse here the millennials are coming for shopping and dining like no before no time before that right. revenge shopping and revenge dining is extremely high in the last one and a half month yeah, so yeah. on one side they don't want to come to the office but they want to come and enjoy <laughs> revenge uh, revenge drinking also <laughs> yeah exactly so what you say i have you know my zen g or millennial daughters that i have they want to work from home but they want to go to dine and they want to go to shop <laughs> But yes, uh, I think uh, businesses have come back to, I would say in most of the locations, they have come back to the pre-COVID levels. I would say. Got it. Rajinder, you know, the, thanks for joining in. Uh, you know, when do we, actually last year was very tough for office demand, you know, 45 million became 25. This year, again, uh, most of the IPCs are forecasting uh, like a 25, 27 million square feet demand again. When do we see that meaningful increase in demand happening? Which year? Is that going to happen? Rentals, you know, have kind of uh, corrected, not gone down too much, but it's still corrected. When do we see both absorption and rentals go up? You know, statistics is already always about, and uh, hi, everyone. Sorry for joining in late. I was stuck on a board call, which kind of stretched longer, so I couldn't ask my board to sign off, uh, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm on the call slightly late, but I'll make up for it. Uh, having said that, uh, Ramesh, Essentially, the, the first 12 to 14 months were more about making sure you can reach firm ground, uh, get the protocols ready, make sure the health and safety protocols are there, uh, handhold the customer for whatever is required. But the picture started becoming clear from a, the technology footprint growth point of view six months ago. You saw employment numbers spike up like crazy. Post that, you saw uh, their revenue numbers coming up dramatically higher. And just when I joined the call, I heard Rajendra say absolutely the exact same thing that every other location, you are COVID safe. But when you come to office, you seem to be insecure about COVID. So that mindset obviously takes some time to change because you've had the flexibility around working from home. So a little bit of your mindset had changed in the 18 months. It'll take three months to get people back uh, full time engaged at the workplace. I can tell you my personal experience since the last three months that I've been here on my desk with 100% occupancy in our offices. The productivity is probably two or three times of what it was. Already. And the same sound gets echoed from a lot of our customers that we speak of. Within private rooms, they say we're nervous. We want to be back in the office as soon as possible. So I think... Uh, you know, I'll, you, I'll just yeah. interrupt you a little bit. Uh, before you joined, uh, you know, a couple of our panelists agreed that especially Anita, said that if you're putting too much of pressure on employees to come back, they're leaving companies and going and joining other companies. So companies are scared to get their employees back. How would you counter something like that? So what's happening is currently the way I see it and the communication we have with big clients is prima facie around the fact, Ramesh, that while they are looking at filling up candidates really quickly because of growth, they are allowing for the flexibility on the resume. But when you discuss with them, they say the second time around and the third time around, we are going to insist on present on the desk if you want to apply for the job. So we are six, nine months away from there. They definitely are clear they want to be at the workplace, but obviously the mandates are not out there. I think you might see between 10 and 25% occupancy on the desk by March. The minute you reach the 40% threshold, and we have to remember the 2080 rule, if 20% of the decision makers are on the desk, the 80% are not far behind. So you will see that over the next 6, 9, 12 months, Ramesh. Yes, currently, yes, there is a lot of flexibility given to new employees you're hiring. At the same time, if you ask them what's their wish list, they say we want them on the desk. But globally, the mandates were not given to them. So obviously, they are still skeptical about making sure the vaccinations get completed. And once that is done, which is another three, six months away, where you have significant numbers in urban India, doubly vaccinated, the story will be different, I think. 
Got it, Vinod. Uh, Amit, uh, the share of uh, flexible workspaces uh, have been going up. And uh, where would you put it uh, today out of the overall leasing? And where would you uh, put it uh, maybe two years, uh, exactly 24 months uh, down the line? So, uh, Ramesh, pre-COVID, uh, right, uh, March 20, we were about 25 million, all operators put together of, let's say, about a billion square foot total commercial real estate portfolio. I think today uh, we are already touching about 50 mil, right, in the last 18 months. So, we have doubled our size. So, it's doubled. Uh, Wow. In, in terms of scale, right? Obviously, on back of uh, a lot of the operators, including us, uh, taking a you know strong bet on flex uh, growing. Um, our sense is, and again, this is back of you know some of our IPC friends' reports, projections, etc. Um, you know, we look at at least touching about 100 to 120 million uh, in the next couple of years. So we will double again in the next 24 months from uh, here. Is, is is our sense? Got it. Uh, Anita, let me ask you the next uh, question. How are you, um, uh, any innovative strategies uh, you are adopting to check utilization uh, rates, occupancy uh, planning, uh, because uh, you, you're one of the largest uh, media companies uh, in the world. And uh, how are you tracking those things? So we've invested a lot, Ramesh, in technology where uh, we've, we've kind of called it as flex seating. And, you know, uh, that's where the, uh, the respective business lead gets the update on what is the utilization of seat is, you know, and how we as a facility uh, lead can see how the space can be optimized and shared with other, uh, uh, other business uh, and affiliate company uh, so one of the beauty is, you know, uh, which which is deriving with the uh, with the technology which comes in, is uh, there's a lot of engagement which we are forecasting. You know, if we are talking about earlier, it was uh, one particular business unit in their net, uh, and you know, just just working together. Now it's the collaborative approach with the with the hotelier seating or flex seating which we are coming up. Uh, so you have multiple business functions sitting under one uh, under one roof and you know there are opportunities which can be discussed there are content or you know some innovative ideas which can be discussed so that is the approach which we are working uh, towards and there are investments which has been put in um, uh, in, in the technology aspect uh, from both the safety perspective and uh, the utilization perspective got it anita uh, rajendra we've been talking about uh, mixed use developments uh walk to work for a while but even today our country doesn't have too many good uh, examples you have like very handful you, you, you can you can actually count them in one hand uh, how many uh, good mixed use developments we have across uh, india what are your thoughts around that uh, mixed use is a very loosely used word i would say ramesh you know people really sometimes they really don't understand what exactly mixed use is and i would like to actually exactly go 180 degree opposite to what you are saying. Uh, you know, I'm, let's look at India. The first three four, three, four decades of independence of India, it was more of an agricultural country or a, more of a, a manufacturing country initially. In the late 90s, India started developing services. So, you know, when the first three, four decades, a manufacturing plant or a farmland was always had to be outside the city. The city was supposed to be a part of residence only. You can't have manufacturing plant inside city or you can't have an agricultural land inside the city. So that thought was there for the first 30, 40 years. Since 90, if you see, services sector has started growing in India. By the turn of the first decade of the 21st century, India became quite good. In the last five years, it has grown really nice. In the last two years, it has outgrown. So what has happened is the share of services sector has really grown dramatic. The more the share of the services sector grows, forget complexes and buildings, cities will become mixed-use developments. What you call in the commercial sense as the mixed-use developments. So now let's take an example of a Gurgaon. Actually, what do you call Gurgaon as? Don't, wouldn't you actually call Gurgaon as a mixed-use city? You have office. You have residential, you have malls, you have hotels, you have hospitals. What more do you want in a mixed-use place? So I think Hinjewadi, let's take an example. 
what do you miss in injewadi it's a mixed use zone of a city look at bkc it has become a mixed use zone you have malls you have hospitals you have offices you have resis as and when this thought grows i think india the complexes will automatically go people have to you know when uh, amit said that people are looking at those tier to cities many people are not looking very looking at them i was very happy that the cities that he named lucknow ahmedabad we are building malls there so i was very happy that you know people are looking at there and we are going there and these tier to cities we are building really mixed use developments today all our properties are retail led but they are proper proper mixed use you know the way you would expect a raffle city i think we are trying to replicate those kind of complexes so if you look at lower parel you have a saint regis you have a phoenix tower as a residential you have a mall you have a office complex there if you look at our pune property it has a million square foot office on sitting on top of a mall if you look at chennai we have three beautiful 30 story towers sitting on top of a mall the terrace of a mall is a golf course <laughs> so we are building mix use but i'm saying you know complexes going forward it has to be there uh, i don't think we'll be able to stay away from it uh, and mix use will stay and you know what from a real estate perspective i would say out of the city would be now not farms it would be logistic centers data centers which are a part of reality now <laughs> data center is one of the key and warehouse well well yeah well said uh, rajendra uh, Sapna, uh, do we have uh, time for some audience questions? Yes, we do have some audience questions as well. Uh, most of the aspects have been covered by our speakers. Uh, you know, um, one of our speakers had mentioned about tier two cities now becoming very uh, attractive for the developers. That is where the mm -hmm. demand seems to be. Um, one of our uh, audience has asked uh, within uh, metros. what would be the locations the favored locations for commercial developments looking at the new way of working now pradeep uh, you want to take that out of the big six cities uh, where do you see most of the demand what are you hearing because you manage facilities for these companies so where are you seeing the most demand i think uh, most important criteria for growth over here is in terms of infrastructure i mean the metros is one thing and even local transport so i think the demand would come up in these cities where the infrastructure is more uh, capable and more developed within these cities like we talk about metro cities are there going to be certain micro markets certain areas or locations that would be preferred maybe like suburbs or not you know uh, the the more uh, the, uh, central business districts is there a shift there i think there's no one better to answer than that question than ramesh himself Yeah, that, that comes <laughs> to you. I mean, he is a master of that. No, no, I'm a moderator, so today I won't answer anything. I'll pass it on to Vinod. Maybe we can take Vinod, it from which, all our speakers. Yeah. It's on. Okay, no problem with me. Okay. No, please problem. go ahead. Vinod, please yeah. Please. So essentially, Ramesh, the way I see it is the cities that are at the forefront of infrastructure investment will gain the lion's share of uh, the millennials that will migrate to these big cities for a lifestyle. while the country is a is a development site and everywhere you have work in progress uh, you're going to see construction and for the next 10 15 years in this country anyways but having said that the big metros who really take infrastructure seriously will get the lion share of population growth and the gdp growth of those micro markets bombay is a classic example of that you've seen uh, the amount of money that's getting spent on infra Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised in the next five to ten years that city will balloon because of the growth it will witness by merging the mainland with the island and the city becoming a metropolitan region purely because of the investment in the airports, the mass rapid transport system, all the other infrastructure that is getting built right now will will pay its dividend five years from today. Uh, a city like Bangalore that has grown uh, dramatically in all directions. needs desperate investment in infrastructure otherwise 10 years later you might see that really suffering because of infra not being put in place you're seeing how hyderabad is growing it's purely grown on the backbone of infrastructure pune is picking up the saddle now to put in money and take infrastructure seriously uh, if any other city emerges with focus on infrastructure at that scale you'll be surprised unknown cities might just come suddenly on the map and grow just like what happened to hyderabad so you will you i think infrastructure is the largest contributor to growth 
and I don't see any tier two, tier three cities having that kind of scale where social infra is going to attract talent for them to invest more money to bring in larger institutions to come in and then fuel in infrastructure growth. Sapna? Okay. Any Ramesh, other audience you, question? Yeah, Ramesh, are you looking at, you know, secondary business uh, areas, uh, developments coming up in metro cities? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in secondary. Actually, uh, for the first time, uh, we are seeing more interest in secondary uh, cities, uh, uh, sorry, secondary business uh, districts than in peripheral, uh, mainly because uh, of this uh, suburban suburbanization which is happening post-COVID. And that's a global trend. I mean, we're in some of the big global cities like New York and uh, uh, London, where people are going back home and they're saying we want to be closer uh, to our workplaces. So, and we don't want to travel too much with uh, things like 15 minute uh, cities. Rajendra spoke about mixed use developments uh, coming up. So, that's definitely uh, happening. SPDs uh, all around, uh, all around in, in Mumbai, Western suburbs, in Chennai, uh, Gindi, ORR, in Bangalore, all the SBDs are doing uh, really well. Sapna. Very okay. good question. Next quick question is about, uh, you know, we have seen integrated developments, residential and uh, office spaces, uh, you know, within the townships. Is there going to be a format of shopping and offices also? We'll see more of that, Mr. Kalkar. Uh, are we going to see that kind of a format also coming up? Coming up? We do have some, but is this the trend going on? Yeah, you see, there's no way out there. We understand one thing. It makes a lot of business sense to do this. Today, the FSI norms in most of the states have really been thrown open. Uh, do one investment of land, build one part of it, earn money from it, and reinvest that without any capital investment. So the annuity business model is here to stay in India. And uh, the best way to encash annuity business model is by way of malls and hotels and offices. So malls and offices are the biggest two right now contributors for annuity business. I think a lot of people are going into this development. And okay. as time goes by, you'll only see it happening more and more. Okay, okay. Another question is interesting one. What is the share of commercial development and co-working? You know, what percentages are right now that we are seeing? The flexible spaces and the regular commercial developments. I thought that was answered by, uh, Amit mentioned that right now, uh, 25 million square feet pre-COVID, now it's around 50. And Amit said that 50 could go to uh, around the 100, 125 million square feet mark uh, in the next uh, two years. So right now, there's close to around 700 million square feet of uh, good quality office space uh, across the country. Okay. So okay. 50 million out of uh, 700 million. Okay, so still there's a long way to go. I think working still has a lot of potential to grow in that sense. No, Sapna, but don't forget that uh, the sector itself is only three, four years old. So... It's been very fast uh, in the last four years. So. Okay, okay. So that was a fast road. Now, one question I which I'll open to all the speakers. What, what uh, you know, with various models of work coming up, according to you, what do the future of offices look like? So we can have, you know, uh, comments from each of our speakers on that. What is their opinion? What the future of office looks like? I Amit, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think a few things which are happening, I, I think there's back of, uh, you know, three, four trends that have come up uh, because of COVID. One, I think hybrid work is here to stay, uh, which will lead to distributed work and will then lead to obviously a network of spaces that companies will work through versus having one central location or a pure headquarter kind of a location. So I think distributed work on back of, you know, hybrid work options is here to stay. Second, I think the big trend, which again uh, was a big surprise for us as well, is that the data center or the server room is separated away from the workspace. Um, unfortunately, all our developer friends, uh, now the, the, the data center, which basically paid the rents in 2019 is separated out. And that will have a big impact on how people think about work uh, going forward, because now uh, that server room can be anywhere. So which means that work can be anywhere, which is a huge change that will uh, happen. And then the third change, which is happening for India specifically, startups from be becoming, uh, being uh, idea generators are today employment generators. And that will allow uh, a lot more growth to happen uh, in commercial real estate. So I think uh, uh, clearly those three trends are the ones we are seeing and which will have a huge impact on commercial real estate. 
All right. Uh, Vinod, we can have your inputs now. So the way I see it is, uh, if you fast forward 12 to 18 months from today, with 50, 60, 70, 80% of the people back in the office and hopefully COVID behind us, uh, you will have to find many reasons to say, I'm working hybrid, I'm going to work from home. Because remember, India, the infrastructure is very different from uh, the global infrastructure in developed economies. The average age of the workforce is 27 here, and it's not 41 and 45 as it is in, in Europe and America. You don't have fancy homes, and you don't have fancy infrastructure in your backyard at your home for you to not want to go back to work. If you want to innovate, you want to ideate, you want to grow, uh, you will have to collaborate, you will be in the workplace. I think the tipping point is the minute 40% of your desks are occupied, the rest of the 40 will want to be at the workplace. You will have a hybrid of 10, 20%, which will probably work maybe once or twice a week, working at home or working from remote locations or depending on subcontracting certain works that you don't need permanent employment for. Those things may still happen. But it will be cumulatively a winner because the number of employees you are hiring now has gone up exponentially. So you may still get some contracts which are low-ended work, migrated to offline mode, staying at home and working and pay them a far cheaper cost to get the same work executed. So you're seeing a lot of that. A lot of large clients have employees working in Coimbatore, employees working in Chandigarh, employees working in uh, Lucknow in the tune of 5,000 and 6,000. But if you ask them, would you want to put an office there? They say, we put a 500 people office. So if they had 5,000 people there and they wanted to do remote working, they would do all of that. They said, no, all these guys in 12 to 18 months will be back in the big cities. We just want to create infra for them to have a variable space occupancy. Okay. So if 12, 18 months forward with COVID hopefully behind us, you will be back on the desk. While work, work ethic might marginally change, workspace efficiencies might change, the expectation around recreational spaces at your workspace might change, densities will be a bad word. All those things will change for sure. Great. Uh, Sapna, if I could use the next few minutes to summarize uh, right, please, the please. Key, key learnings. Uh, so thank you, Anita, Vinod, Pradeep, uh, Rajendra, and Amit uh, for this. Uh, I thoroughly uh, enjoyed moderating this panel. A lot of good uh, ideas uh, came up. Uh, Anita spoke about how all cross-functional uh, units need to collaborate. If people need to come uh, come into uh, and uh, re-entry rates can go up. Still challenging to get back uh, employees. She said they are doing a lot of HR surveys, trying to understand what employees are looking at. She said invest in technologies, minimize touch points. She said, redesign workspaces, uh, maximize uh, greenery within the uh, offices, uh, increase uh, collab zones. Uh, she said, employees are willing to leave companies if pushed to come back to work. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, more flexi seats, uh, more hub and spoke, uh, more swing spaces. Uh, use that to attract uh, people uh, to re-entry. And uh, she said, uh, developers need to focus on giving more lung spaces. Uh, within their uh, campuses. Uh, Amit was quite bullish on tier two cities. He said the reverse migration is real. Uh, lifestyle and opportunities in tier two cities have significantly gone up in the last few years. Uh, one can reduce talent attrition by having uh, a presence uh, in tier two cities. Average costs are lower uh, and war for talent is also uh, minimal in tier two cities. Uh, work from uh, near home is catching up. Uh, he picked up uh, the five cities he picked up was Jaipur, Chandigarh, Ahmedabad, Lucknow, uh, and Kochi. And he said, uh, tier two cities are here to stay. He gave an interesting uh, data point that a billion uh, US dollars have been uh, uh, raised by tier two startups uh, recently. Uh, but he uh, also admitted that real estate is still a challenge in tier two cities to find the right quality uh, space. Pradeep spoke about how uh, second uh, wave uh, was uh, uh, easier. Then the first wave, there are a lot of learnings, but easier to handle. Uh, one has to learn to live with uh, these uh, uh, waves uh, and the current challenges. Uh, more uh, uh, transparency and uh, more uh, interactions with clients is what he does. Uh, he also said uh, he is, uh, given that they are in multiple asset classes, he's identified uh, the risks in each of the uh, asset classes and working on uh, getting that uh, going. Rajendra was... Uh, 
again uh, spoke about how uh, retail is uh, it's been the probably the toughest two years for uh, retail uh, they are focused on giving the confidence back to customers uh, giving the confidence of a safe secure environment to customers and uh, all even in spite of operational costs having gone up uh, safety para uh, parameters there's a lot of money being spent uh, to do that but uh, they are focused on giving that comfort to customers he also said uh, there are a lot more serious shoppers now interesting to hear about uh, revenge shopping and uh, revenge uh, dining uh, vinod spoke about how last 6 months have been good uh, both uh, the biggest consumer of uh, space in the country are it firms and uh, vinod said both hiring and profits have gone up in these uh, it firms uh, productivity a lot more today of companies who are coming back he said it's a matter of 6 to 9 months uh, away from where corporates would really start pushing their employees hard he believes that by march uh, the occupancy levels would be closer to the 25% mark and then the rule of 20 80 applies once the first 20 comes the others will be uh, automatically come amit spoke about how the industry was 25 million pre square feet uh, 25 million square feet pre covid uh, now it's 50 million and uh, he believes how it's to be 100 to 120 million in the next 24 months the co working sector anita again uh, uh, reiterated on the importance of technology and uh, how uh, hoteling uh, multi uh, putting multiple business under one roof is uh, helping rajendra again was quite bullish on uh, how uh, mixed use developments uh, he said even if you're not able to mix everything in one place but at least try and mix things like getting a retail and an office together and how the services sector will uh, lead to more uh, mixed use developments and we know the mention that he's most bullish on mumbai uh, as a city given uh, all the in investments which is happening from uh, an infrastructure uh, point of view uh thank you uh, everyone and thank you sapna for organizing this uh, we uh, thoroughly i thoroughly enjoyed uh, moderating uh, this panel and thank you uh, everyone for your active uh, participation and thank you uh, all the panelists for a terrific uh, panel we'll be posting the key learnings uh, of this uh, in in various media so Thank you. I think we had a lot of honest opinions and views from all our speakers, and uh, I'm sure uh, you know the queries of our audience. Most of them have got covered. You know, we've got the entire uh, spectrum of uh, office spaces, the commercial spaces that uh, you know have been covered by our uh, speakers today. So thank you so much for uh, you know giving us that valuable information that what uh, you know commercial real estate, the office space. looks like and what we can expect going forward so thanks uh, ramesh for summing up so well and you know uh, giving us those key takeaways from this entire discussion and thanks to our speakers as well mr pradeep lala for being here with us anita for you know joining this session and giving us the the tenant uh, point of view and uh, their uh, perspective uh, mr amit ramani always a pleasure to have you on the panel uh mr rajendra kelkar th kalka thank you for being here sharing your views and vinod rohera i know you had been busy and still joined us so thank you so much everyone for being here with us sharing your views and giving us this wonderful conversation thank you very much thank you thanks sapna thanks ramesh thank you Bye -bye.